there. there Okie doke, we're on. Okay. Tonight we have our speaker, Dr. Alvin Tessin Hauser, who's a coordinator of the American Bottom uh, Division of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. She's been involved in archaeology in this area for, for years now. Uh, did, she supervised a lot of the work on the East St. Louis project and the subsequent reports and publications. And tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the unsung heroes of Cahokia cuisine, talking about corn and how it's processed and the importance of it to the, the region, especially in the Mississippi and Curry. So, Eileen. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for joining me tonight and thanks for having me. Um, pleased to be here. I just work five minutes down the road, so it's not too far out of my way. Um, as Bill said, I'm the coordinator of the American Bottom Field Station of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. And we um, do archaeology for transportation projects mostly throughout southern Illinois. So today, uh, I'm just going to kind of give you a brief background and then tell you what I'm going to tell you. And then you'll be impressed, <laughs> or at least believe some of it. Um, so the setting is here, the American Bottom region around 900 to 1400 CE. Um, people who are familiar with the archaeology of the region know it's a really exciting time period when a lot, a lot of things were changing. Um, it's also the time when we first see significant amounts of carbonized corn in archaeological assemblages. Alongside some new types of pottery that might be implicated in um, Hokian corn food ways, we'll say. Um, so, corn on its own kind of lacks a few essential nutrients, uh, unless it's processed, proce processed in a specific way. Um, so, if someone is consuming a large portion of corn, comprises a large portion of their diet, they might suffer some malnutrition. So the research I'm going to be talking about today is um, multi-pronged, but it mostly is aimed at determining whether Cahokians and their immediate predecessors processed their corn. Um, and then also, if they did, how did they do it? What materials and tools did they use? Um, so this project is my baby. <laughs> Um, and it includes three major parts. So it's going to be comparative archaeological data um, from within the region. It's going to be some experimental archaeology and then some archaeometry to bring in some of the archaeological sciences. So the organization of the presentation, I'm going to start with just like a brief history of corn just to orient everyone. Um, and then also look at the history of nishtamalization, which is the term that's used for this type of processing. My current research, <coughs> current research, and hopefully future research on it, um, specifically in the American Bottom region, and then some takeaway points. So, corn's history and nutrition. Um, many of you probably already know that it started as a, a wild plant called Teosinte. Um, it was de domesticated in Mesoamerica more than 6,000 years ago, um, and over that, from that period until Recently, there were many varieties of corn. Um, so from that central Mesoamerican heartland, it spread south to South America and also north into the American Southwest. Um, and then also throughout uh, most of present-day United States. Um, there's some <coughs> debate about the exact timings and roots of, of when domesticated corn came to certain parts of North America. Um, part of this uh, discussion centers on some of the microbotanical remains, so pollen that's um, recovered from lake cores. Um, usually, even in the, the Maya region where they have early corn, they have the pollen that predates um, the carbonized corn in archaeological assemblages. And you see there's a big difference between wild corn and the domesticated, so. So nutritionally, corn is high in sugar, so if you do have a lot of corn in your diet, you're more likely to have cavities. Um, 
but it's also deficient in certain essential nutrients like zinc, niacin, and tryptophan, so some proteins and amino acids. Um, so like I said earlier, if you are relying on corn for a major part of your diet, then um, you might be deficient in these essential nutrients and it can cause malnutrition. And in some cases it can be severe um, and cause even death, um, which is mostly the, the niacin deficiency. Um, so it's not actually corn that's causing that, it's the fact that there's a large portion of your diet where you're missing some other essential nutrients that the corn can't give you unless it's processed. Um, so, that was, so those are the two main ways to avoid <laughs> malnutrition while eating a lot of corn is one, to just not eat a lot of corn, um, eat a diverse diet, supplement it with proteins and other essential nutrients, um, or you can process the corn to release the, the nutrients that are actually in corn, but you just can't digest them. Um, so one part of this that kind of got me on this track was looking at this uh, comparative anthropological study that looked at um, groups that grew corn and ate corn and also may or may not have processed it. So this study showed that um, in almost every case where a group was um, growing and consuming a lot of corn, they were also processing it. And areas where they didn't necessarily, it didn't make a major part of the diet, they didn't necessarily process the corn. Um, so yeah, by doing this processing, it releases nutrients and makes the corn more, some nutrients in the corn more digestible and so much more I'll get to in a minute. <laughs> um, so nishtamalization and its history. Um, so what is this process called nishtamalization? The term itself is a is stems from a Nahuatl term. Um, so that's the language of the Aztecs. And there's a couple of different translations to it, but it's mostly um, basically cooking corn and ashes or, or lime. So the basic process is that you harvest your dried corn, you shell it to get the kernels, you then soak the kernels um, in an alkaline solution and also cook them in that solution. And then you rinse and drain um, to get rid of the alkaline solution because it can be a terrible taste and also burn your mouth. <laughs> um, so at that point, that's when we, that's how you create hominy. Um, that's, hominy is a process, a nishtamalized corn kernel. Um, so you can either eat it like that, like many of us do, or you can grind it into a dough. Um, and that's typically what's done, you know, in the, the What in would have been a common alkaline solution? <laughs> I'm going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and that makes the base of so many different foods and dishes and drinks. Um, the ones we're probably most famil familiar with are tortillas and tortilla chips. So the effects of nishtamalization um, are many, as you can see. So the, the alkaline solution will cause the hard shell of the corn to soften and, and loosen, so it re is removed, um, easy to remove, and then also the corn kernel itself swells. Um, the nutrients are released and made more digestible, <coughs> so you don't have those deficiencies that unprocessed corn has. There's partial gelatinization of starches, which allows um, you to form a dough without gluten, basically. Um, so just some water and the ground corn will form a dough, and that's what tortillas are made out of. Um, it also kills bacteria and mold, the alkaline solution. Um, if there's anything growing on your dried corn kernels, you put it in that solution, and it's, it's <coughs> sanitized, basically. Um, and then there's also other Characteristics that are changed in the corn. So obviously it gets bigger, but it also changes color, it changes texture, and it changes flavor. Um, if you're using a carbonate based um, nishtamalization agent, then that also adds a calcium supplement to your diet. Um, and then at this, at either point, either as hominy or as <coughs> this masa dough, um, it can also be dried and stored for later use. And like I said, there's many different types of foods that can be um, made using this base. Um, you can add various other ingredients to it. This bottom one is a, a cornbread that's common among the Haudenosaunee up in um, the Northeast. They just boil
boil that bread, they form it into a dough and add beans and other seasonings to it and boil it in water. Um, the one on the top right is from the Choctaw. It looks very similar to a tamale. It's a, it's sim a similar type of bread though, where it's that corn dough plus beans and other seasonings wrapped in a corn husk and boiled. Um, and then just some kind of grilled cakes and tortillas. Um, there's also some drinks that you can make out of this that are common in, in Mexico these days. So the basic elements of the mishnabalization process are you need your dried corn kernels, um, your alkaline solution, which is typically made from either hardwood ash, which is in the middle there, or um, hydrated lime, um, which you can buy in grocery stores or online. And um, I'll be talking more about that in a minute. And then also a pot to soak and cook your corn in and water. So that's basic, basically it. Um, you need a spoon to stir it, but it's pretty, um, you know, not complex technology, but it ends up being a pretty complex and interesting process. And for most of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about this part specifically, the, the alkaline solution. Um, so how do you create this alkaline solution? One way is, is using wood ash, hardwood ash, um, and you can either just put ashes in that pot with the, with the corn kernels and the alkaline solution and water directly, or sorry, the corn and the water. Um, another way is to leach the ash and make lye. So you can put it in a barrel or a big pot and soak it in water, the ashes, and then pour the liquid off the bottom. And then you can add that, that liquid to your corn. Um, the other type of alkaline solution you can make is made from carbonate-based materials, and the most common ones are going to be limestone and shell. So for this process, it's, it takes a couple more steps to make that solution. Um, so you'll want to fire your limestone or shell to a high enough temperature that it converts to quicklime, um, and that's about 800 degrees Celsius or about 1500 Fahrenheit. Then pour the water over the quicklime and it causes this exothermic re reaction so it releases heat and the limestone itself at, or shell will expand and crumble into kind of a, a powder. Um, during that process the water that comes off of the limestone or shell is, um, the term for that is nahayote um, and that's, that's basically the alkaline solution there. So you could either just add that liquid directly or you could take that the powder that's formed from the crumbling limestone and shell um, and, and use that later um, in its powder form added to the corn and water. Another way that you can use it later is by um, adding just a little bit of water to that powdered lime and compressing it in a, a mold of some sort. So you can make basically it's like a salt, a salt cone but it's a lime cone. So the, you might see from here, just based on this description, that the, making it from limestone or shell is a little bit more labor intensive, mostly because you'll make ashes in the very first step of making <laughs> the limestone shell version, and those ashes themselves will be used to mishnabalize corn. Um, so remember that for later. Another thing to think about is the actual lime cycle. So when I talked about uh, heating it to 800 degrees Celsius that drives off carbon dioxide from the limestone and converts it to quick lime. And then when you add water, it's that exothermic re reaction and it turns it into slaked lime. Um, if slaked lime is just left out to the elements, um, you know, just to air, then it will absorb carbon dioxide from the air and turn back into limestone. Um, so if you think about that in terms of archeology, span we'll never find slaked lime. <laughs> Unless it's like an anaerobic environment, maybe, but um, it'll all just revert back to limestone. Um, so, history of mishnabalization. So, much like corn, it starts in Mesoamerica. Um, there's evidence for it being used as far back as 1000 BC, maybe BCE, maybe even earlier, among the Olmec and the, the early Maya. 
same process using when you use limestone to make this um, alkaline solution. That same process is used to make mortar and uh, like plaster and stucco for that was used to decorate the this, the pyramids, the Maya and Aztec pyramids, um, and make decorative elements for that. So they were making lime. Linguistics, there's uh, among the Maya, they have, I'm not sure of the total number of words that are used for specific types of limestone, but it's many, like over 20, I think. Um, so it shows that they're differentiating different types of limestone based on their characteristics and uses. Um, and some limestones are better for mishnabalizing, and others are better for making plaster and stucco. Um, and then there's also doc historical documentation in codices that show that there's actually basically a profession of a person who is the seller of lime, um, a shatterer of rocks, a burner of limestone, a slaker of lime. And then even in the description, it just gives a basic description of the process of creating slaked lime. In terms of archaeology, so we have in the Maya region, there's um, these lime kilns. So they're pretty big, you can fit a lot of limestone in there and they just would pile a bunch of wood on the limestone and then burn it all down and then pour water over that. So you can make a lot of lime in something that size. Um, in terms of the artifacts that we might associate with Nishtamalization, there's um, models of matates for grinding the corn into masa dough and then also comales, which are really kind of flat griddles that they're making tortillas on. Um, and then these are interesting because they're basically a, a colander, a ceramic colander, and that was um, a way to rinse the corn after it's been initialized and get that alkaline solution off. So it's just a pot with many, many holes in it, just like a, a sieve. Um, I assume there's limestone quarries. I haven't looked into can't imagine that there isn't one <laughs> in the Maya region, especially. Um, this is kind of just give you an idea of what you might see archaeologically or look for equivalents in the in the American Maya region. So initialization north of present-day Mexico was very widespread, as I mentioned earlier, of coast to coast. Most of the historical documentation, there, the everyone was basically using wood ash. Um, there are a few instances where lime is mentioned, mostly like in the southwest. Um, and a lot of times when they say when they're describing the process of cooking, um, they'll say that the whoever's cooking said that they're adding the ashes for um, basically seasoning or flavor, um, rather than like I'm doing this to make. Linguistically, hominy is an Algonquian term, um, so that was, it's a, it's a Native American term for nishtamalized corn. Um, and then the archaeological evidence we have is somewhat hard to read at this point, but um, Rachel Briggs has done a lot of studies on um, nishtamalization using wood ash um, in the Moundville area and looking at the, the shape and use where on. Also, um, I've seen I've seen these kind of wooden mortar and pestles all across the eastern woodlands and into the plains. So, um, using those wooden mortars and pestles to, to crush the corn and grind it up. Um, archaeologically, you know, after a thousand years, unless it's burned, we probably wouldn't see much of that. Um, so that's a little frustrating. But so moving on to in the American bottom and the research that I'm doing right now. Um, so we know that there is obviously evidence for corn being grown and eaten in the American bottom, probably starting around 900 CE. And that's based on seeing these agricultural implements. They're probably also used for excavating and other, um, for other tasks, but probably also agricultural. We see the carbonized um, corn kernels and, and cob fragments. 
to have some isotopic data that indicate that maize is being, being consumed. Um, and sometimes and sometimes those signatures indicate that, that a lot of corn was, was being consumed by the individual. Um, so we don't really have the direct evidence of um, mishtamalization, but there's some circumstantial, I'll say. <laughs> um, so even though, even the people who were eating a significant amount of corn and taking a large portion of their diet, they didn't seem to really severe, suffer from severe malnutrition. Um, there's these new agri forms that, sh that show up in ceramic assemblages alongside corn. Um, so they, were, they weren't in use before corn arrived on the scene in these in larger quantities. Um, and then we also see concentrations of Maybe they were mishtamalizing corn, but we kind of have to prove it <laughs> for science. So again, we're gonna I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about these new pottery forms, some with white residues. So the white residue will be important. Um, so another reason we might think that Kokians mishtamalized corn is that their limestone is abundant here in the north and south ends of the American bottom. We have some pretty dramatic bluff lines with some very high quality, high calcium limestone. So it's available and and um, they were using limestone for other purposes also. So they, they knew of it as a source. Um, and then geologically, they've done you know, tested limestones all across the US and there's definitely a concentration of high calcium limestone in the American bottom region. So some other inspiration for this project includes, you know, stumpware, which is a, an old friend to many American bottom archaeologists. Um, Titterington in 1938 kind of described it, um, and it basically looks like a tree stump, so that's why it's called stumpware. Um, and then, as Bill mentioned, I was involved with the, the excavations at East St. Louis where we had, you know, over a thousand stumpware, individual stumpware vessels that we recorded during the analysis. Um, myself, I did over 200, analyzed 200 stumpware, so we're old friends. Um, and then also this publication by Elizabeth Benchley, who, who said, based on the use wear that's observed, that white residue that's observed on some of the stumpware, and then later on Mississippian funnels, um, that maybe they were, they were processing corn with this alkali solution, and that they were using these utensils to create and then I was inspired to make a crochet version of a stumpware. <laughs> <laughs> I like combining my hobbies, my hobbies and interests. Um, so just to give you a sense of what stumpware looks like, if you haven't seen it before, it's really thick walled. It has very coarse temper. Um, it's tempered with a variety of materials, from uh, grog to grit, limestone or shell. Sometimes it's a mix of multiple types of temper. Um, they're rather simple shapes, so it's usually a funnel shape with two of these prongs at the bottom that we just call feet. Um, and they typically do have a full funnel through the middle, so they have a, a larger orifice at the top of the vessel and then a smaller one at the bottom, but there's a lot of variation in terms of where that, that bottom orifice is, whether it's going straight to the bottom or it's going out the front. And sometimes there's even an additional um, hole going through the vessel from front to back through that that other funnel. Um, and you'll see that sometimes they're cord marks, sometimes they have plain surfaces. Um, and this one on the bottom right here, you can see the color of it. That's not a typical color of clay that's fired around here. It has it's just totally covered in that white residue. And this gives you another kind of inside view of what a stumpware would look like. So that one has the, the orifice going out the front, this one's going straight down to the bottom. So there are a lot of hypothesized uses over the years of what stumpware could have been used for um, as pot supports, as this old um, photo from Cahokia Mounds shows, and then also uh, the possible use of it in salt production, which obviously does show that there's some white, you know, salt-based residue on those, um, we call it like, on these. 
really support these interpretations. So based on that, and then Elizabeth Benchley's article, the same corn. Here's a close-up view of white residue. I don't know if you can see it too well, but there's definitely like a, a layer of white stuff on the exterior and usually like the rim and exterior surface of the pots. And it'll accumulate in the cord mark impressions on cord marked vessels. Let me just grab some water. Any questions right now before I get into the actual research? <laughs> What about the uh, burning that you see around, around the rim of a lot of stump of barrel? And you see charred uh, black and Yeah, um, I mean, sometimes I think that's probably just from the, the firing of the pot. You can get some carbonized remains or carbon deposits on the interior from firing it. Um, and then also post-depositional processes could, could result in carbon being deposited on it. And also they could be used for more than one, one purpose. So, um. I have a question. Mm -hmm. what, I, don't, I guess I'm trying to figure out what point they would think putting this in their food was a good idea. Like, was there something else they were doing that made that logical? I, my guess right now is that wherever, wherever the corn originally came from, whoever they were in touch with, when they first got started making, first started growing corn on a large scale, that they probably were like, you gotta process this, but they didn't really tell them the steps to do it. Um, it's because we don't really see the same technology in the Southwest or in Mesoamerica or really anywhere. This stumpware is pretty unique to the American bottom. Um, so I'm, it's, and also they were using limestone for other purposes and. In earlier periods, they could have been using it for stone boiling, which would, if you're firing your stone boiling stones to 800, I think you're overdoing it, but um, it's, it's possible um, that they would have observed that. And there's, I think some people have also considered that maybe that was, um, they were also using limestone possibly for processing nuts before they were using it for corn. Um, but I don't remember the specifics on that. I assume you tried to duplicate this process. We're getting to that. Does it make it taste better? Well, I haven't eaten anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there any evidence for um, plaster for in the American bottle? Not plaster, no. And there's hardly even any evidence for daub, so there's not a lot of a lot of that. Um, So the, the project that I'm working on right now has these three major parts. One is to compile the contextual archeological data, um, looking at density and distribution of stumpware and the, the morphological variability of it. Um, and then eventually seeing if there's correlations with the density and distribution of limestone and then um, carbonized plant, corn, corn remains. Um, there's the experimental archaeology portion is just basically making stumpware and using it. Um, and then the archae or archaeometric analyses uh, on archaeological samples to actually figure out what that white residue is. Um, and then also on cooking pots to see if they were cooking nishtamalized corn versus unprocessed corn. So the contextual data, like I said, I worked at East St. Louis. We had over 6,000 features there. They dated to that whole, basically that whole time period that I'm interested in, coincidentally. <laughs> um, 900 to 1350 CE. Uh, there was a large um, terminolite woodland, so AD 900 to 1050 um, terminolite woodland village with multiple courtyards and hundreds of structures. Um, so the stumpware in the American bottom is typically made during that time period of like 900 to 1100 CE. Um, and so we have that full range at this site, which is interesting. And this is also because we were aware of white residue that we should record it <laughs> in a kind of a systematic way. So this is one of the largest archeological assemblages where that sort of information was systematically gathered. Um, so this is just showing the distribution of stumpware among the late portion of the termite woodland period. So um, 
975 to 1050. And this is the densest settlement um, during that pre-Mississippian time. But the, you don't really have to pay attention to the dots. Each dot is a feature, and it just says if there's plain stumpware, if there's cord marked stumpware, or if there's plain and cord marked stumpware. Um, but you see it's distributed throughout the occupation. It's concentrated in some areas. Those are also the areas where the occupation was densest. Um, but if we look at it, kind of standardize it by the, the total number of structures, there's in the early part of the Termalite Woodland, it was probably about one stumpware per structure. In this later part, it was up to like two and a half per structure. Um, but basically what this is kind of telling me, along with the, the morphological variation, is that people were kind of making and using these at a household level. Um, and especially on, in the earlier part of this time period, I think they were experimenting with it. So there, there are different shapes and morphologies and um, you know, surface treatments and stuff. So they were kind of experimenting with developing this technology. Don't read any of this table. It's just a bunch of numbers. Um, I'm still in the process of compiling this information and processing it myself. Um, but basically, this shows you kind of the difference between early terminal late woodland and late terminal late woodland stumpware densities. And in that top table, there's a lot of zeros. So a lot of sites, a lot of these earlier sites don't have any stumpware. Um, and the ones that do, it's not very dense, um, usually less than one per structure. And in the later time period, there's almost every site has at least one stumpware. And then also the densities are higher. And you can also kind of see that the East St. Louis assemblage is uh, like way bigger than anybody else's. <laughs> so it's kind of a great assemblage to have to work with. Um, so moving on to the, the archaeometric part of the analysis, um, we used PXRF, which is portable x-ray fluorescence, um, on just a sample of stumpware that showed this white residue to see if we could see what elements were making up that white residue. And the hypothesis there is that if it's a calcium-based, if they're using it to make an alkaline solution and it's calcium-based, we should have a lot of calcium in that white residue. Um, if it's based on uh, wood ash, then we would expect more potassium. If it's not used for, if it's used for uh, salt, it would be uh, NaCl, I forget what they are, but <laughs> different elements. Um, sodium, obviously. Um, so anyways, we did just like a handful of stumpware samples from East St. Louis, and we looked at the different surfaces. So we, we analyzed the, the surfaces that had the white residue and surfaces that didn't. So the white residue was mostly on the exterior and rim surfaces. The interior and the core or the broken edge of the sherd didn't really have any white residue. Um, and so the results were pretty interesting. Um, the orange there is the percent of the total counts that were calcium. So you can see all of them have peaks in calcium. Um, on an individual shirt, the, this one is an especially good example. So the rim and the exterior surface have really high percentages, whereas the core doesn't. So what that's, what that's telling us is that it's, it is measuring that white residue. Um, so it's telling us that that white residue has a high proportion of calcium. And then it's also telling us that it's not based on post-depositional processes. So if, it, if a sherd was in a pit with a bunch of burned limestone, you might expect some calcium deposits all over the sherd rather than just on the exterior. So that was pretty convincing. For We were excited when we saw that. <laughs> um, so yeah, the elevated calcium counts around the exterior and lip where the white residue is, they... Um, there were no significant differences in potassium, so it doesn't seem like it's a wood ash base. Um, and obviously, we got we have to do more samples because we only have like twelve that are done, and we have fourteen hundred stumpware we could analyze. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the experimental studies were fun because we got to go out and collect clay from the region, and we. Got t we used tempers that were locally available. Um, and we also, while we were at it, collected limestone from 
from the Alton area where, where we were pretty sure there was some high calcium limestone. So we made um, stumpware based on kind of the average size and shape of stumpware from East St. Louis and then um, fired it a bit too high, I think. They're pretty, <laughs> pretty over-fired. Um, and then, um, and then we used them as if they were used for making lime, slaked lime. Um, so we did fire, uh, so we, you can see we fired these in an open pit. I fired the limestone just like in a chimney in my backyard. So it was pretty basic technology and it was successful. So this is, that's the burned limestone. Is it gonna play? Yeah, so it's, it's not showing it, but <laughs> when, when we poured the water over the burned limestone that's in the stumpware, it did create that exothermic reaction. So it, it um, sizzled, like you could hear it, and it was steam was coming off. And then also you can see here how it's turning to powder. Um, and then just a basic litmus test tells us that it's very highly alkaline. Um, so I would also call that a success for us. Um, and then this is just for fun, a piece of limestone in a stump, a piece of stumpware from East St. Louis. Um, there was a little bit of white residue afterwards on the stumpware that we used, but it didn't really match what we saw um, in the archaeological samples. Um, so I think we'll have to do some more repeated uses and see if anything that looks like that the archaeological samples develops. Um, and I'll probably play around also with maybe plugging the bottom, the bottom orifice and like holding the liquid in there for a bit longer to see if that helps um, get the, get the, that residue to develop. So you can make slaked lime just using materials and technology that Cahokians would have, would have had and their predecessors. Um, and you can make a very strong alkaline solution that's definitely capable of nishtamalizing corn. Um, um, so what, another piece of this is that I want to do that same PXRF analysis after using these stumpware multiple times to see if I get similar results at, to the archaeological samples. Um, this is another kind of branch of this research that I'm involved with where um, some researchers out of Boston University um, did some experimental archaeology to see if there was a microscopic way of determining whether um, unprocessed corn or nishtamalized corn was cooked in a pot based on absorbed residues that are in the, the earthenware pots. And so they did the experimental archaeology and confirmed that there is a structural difference in these um, starch spherulites. So you can tell a difference between nishtamalized corn and non-nishtamalized corn on that microscopic level in um, they hypothesize that you could see it in archaeological samples absorbed. Yeah? Would that be the same with uh, wood ash? Um, yes, this is, this is just basically saying if the, if the corn itself was nishtamalized, it doesn't say whether it was done with ash or a lime-based lime solution. Um, and then there is the first confirmed ID of nishtamalized corn from archaeological context in the Maya region that just came out in 2021. So this is a, a vein of research that should be productive for saying if Cahokians and their predecessors ate nishtamalized corn. Um, so the, yeah, these are the people I'm collaborating with uh, is Amber Vanderwalker and Emily Johnson at um, UCSB out in Santa Barbara. And so I selected a few jars from throughout East St. Louis's occupation, jars that I considered cooking jars that were also in similar in context that also had limestone or um, funnels. And so they did the analysis, the initial analysis, and weren't terribly successful in um, actually retrieving the starch spherulites. They're probably s still stuck in the vessel is <laughs> what they're thinking is because of, of the, the clay soils in the American bottom. It's, they're just hanging in, they're, they're very absorbed and hard to get out of the vessel wall. But I'm still hopeful on this, this part of the research because we could say 
this would be a direct way to say that they did nishtamalize corn and cook it and eat it. So discussion in future directions. Um, so again, I think this variability in the stumpware, the fact that it shows up at the same time that corn does in noticeable levels, um, and the distribution of stumpware at East St. Louis at least, it seems like they were being made and used at the household level and they were probably developing this technology. Um, they might, might have had an idea of the process, but they didn't have the tools at hand, so they were creating them. Um, the PRX, PXRF did confirm that the white residue on the stumpware that we have from East St. Louis is calcium based, so that's another piece of evidence to say that they were making this alkaline solution out of limestone. Um, and then the experimental studies prove that it's possible and you can make a really potent alkaline solution. Uh, so the reason I call it the unsung heroes of Cahokian cuisine was because limestone and stumpware, if you're an archeologist, you're like, you're not very impressed by either one. Um, but they're incredibly important to supporting Cahokia's growing population. Um, and the fact that Kogia could even become a, an, an America's first city, really. Um, and then the use of the of limestone is a culinary cho choice. It's not because it was easy, because it obviously takes extra steps. Um, but it is a specific culinary choice, and it's probably because of it does add a different flavor than the ashes do. do. And also, um, it connects people to the, this particular landscape where we have these limestone bluffs. Um, so another thing to consider is what is a nishtamalization toolkit? You know, it varies depending on where you're living and what you're eating and how you're cooking your corn. Um, so possibly in the American bottom, this might be the terminalite woodland ceramic toolkit for nishtamalization, um, which includes the cooking jar, the stumpware for making that alkaline solution, and then a large bowl maybe for making breads and cooking breads and stuff. And then also just throwing this out there, Cahokian Komal. This is a very shallow plate that looks similar to those Mesoamerican examples, but it's the only one I've seen. <laughs> I just thought I'd like throw that out there. Another thing I want to do, I want to mention is that there is a, this process is, has never been lost. Like people have been doing this since, you know, a thousand BCE, um, and they still are a lot. Uh, you know, in Mexico, it's there's a significant population there that still does this, um, and they're growing heirloom varieties of corn to kind of uh, maintain that connection. And then also there are. Um, chefs, like um, professional chefs that are incorporating nishtamalization into their um, dishes for modern palates. So they're using these older practices that are connecting them to, in some cases, their own history, um, and then also um, sharing it with people who might not have tried it before. Um, so I think it's an important thing to support. and. Next steps, I probably don't have time for these, but <laughs> personally in my life, but I do, I would really love to explore collaborations with tribal nations that have ancestral ties to Cahokia and possibly, um, you know, work with them to maybe try making some dishes with corn nishtamalized with Cahokia region limestone. Um, and then also maybe contribute if they're interested in in sort of uh, food sovereignty type studies or research. Um, the comparative data I got to compile, um, repeat the use. Um, I want to also try like just creating a, a lime cone using stumpware because that shape would be conducive to taking that sleek lime powder and making it into a portable type of um, powder. So. In that way, maybe people at East St. Louis, especially because there were so many stumpware there, um, and they were maybe hosting some feasts, they could have sent people home with some um, some of that powdered lime for their own home use. 
which also allows them to like, bring a piece of Cahokia back with them. Um, and then additional PXRF, additional um, looking at those spherulites. And then also there's a, another thing that I hadn't considered until I read one article where <laughs> they were talking about this lime cycle, um, the fact that it becomes, it absorbs carbon dioxide from the air rather than the original environment that the limestone was formed in, which is usually underwater, um, that we can see if a piece of limestone was, had, has gone through that whole lime cycle. So maybe at one point in time, it was slaked lime, but then it converted back to limestone. Um, there's also, we did have some, one of the geologists at the ISGS look at some samples of limestone from East St. Louis, and he did say that they were that really high quality, high calcium limestone that's available in this region. So um, that's it for me. And I just want to thank Bill and everyone here who joined me tonight. Um, the Illinois Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration, we were involved with the East St. Louis excavations and then my various collaborators. And then this is what I'm doing when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> Having a cocktail made with that. <laughs> so. Thanks. Would there be, would it be impossible to have evidence that they had any knowledge that this process was in fact healthier, or is just the fact that it was in such widespread use and creation of that um, off its own? The fact that they mostly in the the historic documents talk about it adding flavor, that it's probably not necessarily um, like in the front of their mind that it's making it healthier. Um, I also think that, and then there was another account, I think it was from Mesoamerica, where they were mostly saying um, that they did, they did that to make the grinding easier. Um, and then there was another, what was the other thing? Um, oh, for storage. So it makes it so that you can use the, the dried corn. Um, and it's like, a, it's a really hard dry corn, it's that flint corn. Um, so it does make for long-term storage possible. Um, so there are a lot of benefits that aren't nutritional to this process, and I think all of those together probably. Would the smoke from ashes contain the same chemical composition of the ashes itself? Because I can see smoke getting mixed into all this stuff easily. I don't know. I don't know what smoke's made of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mesquite. And, and, I've and heard of that. But. The, the, the barbecue. Yeah, so yeah, that I don't know. But it would it would leave a, a carbon residue, I would think, a, a black carbon residue on on it. Does this help explain why you get that greasy limestone in? Uh, Feature fill. That it might. Some of it is from this slaking. It might, yeah. I mean, some of it's some of the limestone is really burned, like it's really highly burned and and disintegrating. So maybe it's just not fully back to being um, re limestoned. <laughs> so the purpose is to produce the, the liquid solution that's, that you soak the corn in. Yeah, either the liquid solution or the powdered version that you can add. Would be any advantage of having to burn limestone in the pot too? That is ill-advised because of that exothermic reaction. So the it could be pretty volatile um, if you just put quick lime into a bucket of water and it'll like explode and could cause the pot to explode. And what like percentage of have you done experiments or anybody done how much you have to have in a pot? Yeah, there's and it's not a lot. So like a, the pot that I showed earlier that had the corn in it with the paddle, um, they put in maybe like a cup of wood ash and it's even less of the, cap, the, the slaked lime is required. I think there was one thing I read where it was, they put equal parts of corn and water in and then like two tablespoons of the lime. So it's, I mean, it's pretty strong. So the quantity you could get from a, a stump where it would be adequate for a meal. 
Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, you could probably get a couple meals worth out of it. Um, it's depending on like how often you eat that meal and, um, and if you're hosting any guests or anything. That, um, that would also be ill-advised because um, the, the pottery that has shell or limestone temper can't be fired to very high temperatures because, of, because it that goes through the same process. The, and it will spall and fl you know, flakes of the pot will come off and it could cause it to just disintegrate. I think, didn't you have a shell-tempered pot that disintegrated once, Larry? Where? A shell-tempered pot that disintegrated. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had several of them. Sat on the mantle for three years and then yeah, so it just, woke up just dust. the pot will just absorb water from moisture from the air and fail. And I, I have some on my shelf that are failing right now. Yeah, so it can, <laughs> can be beans and it was over fire. Yeah. So and that's so base ceramic turns or clay turns to ceramic around seven hundred Celsius and then the limestone and shell turn to quick lime at eight hundred. So it's a pretty small window for firing a shell tempered pot or a limestone tempered pot. Then what are they cooking again? Well, the, you're cooking it at much lower temperatures. Temperature? Yeah, you're cooking it, you know, just over some coals. So they in what? In, in a very tempered vessel? No, I mean you can use a shell. You can use a shell tempered or um, limestone tempered pot to cook it because it's not getting up to that. 800 degrees when you're cooking it, yeah. It'll be burned if you do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. yeah. I've never been in a restaurant where they actually advertise adding ashes and calcium for your coin. <laughs> there is um, the... I'll pay closer attention I know, to um, in case I missed it. I know Mission Taco does nichtimalized tortillas. Yeah. So. Even if they don't say that, that's, I think they're using Cal, but. Uh, we have a question from the line. Oh. One of the viewers is wondering if slate lime has been linked to use for other purposes aside from nichtimalization. Um, I mean, it has, it's in the Maya region and Aztec, it was for plaster and um, stucco. And there's infinite uses today. Like people use it um, sometimes if they have acidic soils in their garden, they'll add a little bit of. Um, of that slaked lime to help make it more basic or less acidic. Now, obviously, the uh, stumpware is more associated with the thermal flavor. Mm -hmm. When you, you head to Mississippi and you start to have those funnels, which you think are, have a similar function. Yeah, and the, the funnels also seem to have this white residue on them often. It most it's kind of gradual through the loman, and then like Sterling has its own particular ceramic ideas. So I think there's there's like a few in East St. Louis, but they could just be holdovers or you know redeposited from a so another you earlier feature. To um, that I don't know. I they could still be using limestone, or they could be they they were using a bunch of shell to temper their pots. Um, I mean, they could just use shell for everything. We don't see we don't usually see as much burned limestone in Mississippian assemblages as we do in the Termalate woodland. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure on that one. Any ethnographic evidence of Eastern North America or only in the Southwest? Um, I think I probably saw one brief mention that said they, like maybe they also added a bit of limestone to for flavor, um, but I'd have to go back through my notes. <laughs> It was definitely not common. It's it's pretty dominantly um, wood ash, especially in the eastern woodlands. In the back. Yeah, was there an industry for trading the portable slate lime things that they would just have to like going home with outside of the American? Um, I don't I don't think there was an industry really. I think it was probably part of this kind of 
communal sharing of food and being a part of this place and sending them off. There is, there's one assemblage that's always bothered me. The, it was the one I used for my dissertation. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a Termalite Woodland site that had a ton of pottery and not a single stumpware. And it, it definitely should have. But it was also not very far from poultry mounds. Um, so maybe they were just being supplied with their, um, with their lime from, from poulter. I don't think so. I think it's pretty much the same in terms of calories, um, but it's just so much more um, of the nutrients are released in the in the processed corn. Did you read anything about people trying to burn shells instead of limestone? There is there was a region in Mesoamerica in the Maya region that they were using shell, um, and but I haven't seen any, I don't know if they were like using Gulf Coast shell or if they were using freshwater shell. Um, and I don't know if that would make a difference either. Was the corn grown in North and South America found in any other parts of the world? Not until in industrial agriculture. <laughs> they exported it to, to Europe, I assume. Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. I mean, it's a great yeah. livestock. It was pretty early, not. early 1600s. Yeah. Europe. I've occasionally seen, very rare, but stuff where it doesn't have the hole going through or bottom or the front. It just has yeah. a cone. And, uh, any thoughts on what? Yeah. So, I, like, I think, I think um, that that is part of that experimentation. From my experience, I, those have mostly been in the earlier terminal assemblages. Um, and maybe they, they're like, it's got to be a cone, but they didn't realize that it had to have another outlet. Um, there's also the possibility that they didn't actually need the outlet, that that was a development for later to make it easier to drain the liquid out um, so that you could get the dried, the dried powder version rather than just the, the liquid. And it would hold, it would hold the, um, the liquid against the, burned limestone for longer so you could get more of a reaction, more of it um, would slake. I also wonder if there's a, a practical reason for having the, the holes other than mixtalization. Uh, if you've got a thick piece of pottery mm -hmm. and you've got holes in it, that allows the distribution of heat when you're yeah. firing it, then it keeps it from exploding and cracking. That's true, yeah. Yeah, but the the funnels aren't, they don't have that problem, right. you know, they still have that, that bottom opening later. Thank you. Thank you.